So last week you had the most epic workout of your life. You came in breathing fire, weight was flying across the room at light speed, and you decided intelligently that for once in your life you were going to actually delay gratification. Instead of taking the opportunity to hit the absolute biggest weight that you could, you were going to take a week, heal up, recover, and come in prepared to really hit an impressive number. So a week goes by and you come in. You didn't party with your friends the night before, you stayed home, you carbo-loaded, you went through your visualization techniques, and you came in the next day just ready for a bloodbath. Now, as you start warming up, you notice the bar's a little heavy, and by the time you get through your warm-ups, you're getting the sense that it's not quite your day. Now, you're determined to hit that number you've had in the back of your head this whole time, so you continue forward. You pile on weight 10 pounds at a time until finally you get to that goal weight. And as you take that deep breath, take that hit of ammonia salt, take the bar out of the rack and bring it down to your chest, it crushes you like a ton of bricks. Your hopes, your dreams, your pride are just devastated. So in that situation, when you've been training your ass off, you're fully recovered, your energy stores are topped off, and you're not detrained, yet you still fail to perform the way that you've been performing. We generally refer to that phenomenon as CNS fatigue. Not only is CNS fatigue likely in a lifter, it's actually what all of strength programming is designed to prevent. Now, I actually hate the discussion around CNS fatigue because what should be a good faith concerted effort by all of the experts in the field to try to educate young lifters on how to sidestep this inevitability, it actually ends up devolving into a semantic argument by a bunch of pedantic know-it-alls. See, the problem is that there's a lot of fuzziness surrounding CNS fatigue. We don't know exactly what it is, and that leaves room for a lot of misinterpretation both on the side of the typical gym goer who's been making a lot of bad life choices and wants to blame his run of shitty workouts on his quote unquote CNS fatigue and on the part of these know-it-alls that want to be able to just correct people by flexing their knowledge of the three studies they skimmed over. So which is it? Is the gym bro complaining of his CNS fatigue a whiny loser? Is it actually the know-it-all who's claiming the CNS fatigue doesn't exist? Am I the whiny loser? For answers to that and more, stay tuned. So to get into the discussion about CNS fatigue, we have to be clear about what we're talking about. As far as force production is concerned, actually being strong in a workout, you have to look at the body from two different perspectives. There's the actual muscles. Those are the little engines. You can think of them as motors, which is why we call bundles of muscle fibers motor units. The nervous system is the circuitry that actually innovates the muscle. Now, just like a car engine, if there's nothing wrong with it, if it's perfectly intact, its potential for producing force is going to always be the same. Now, if you run into a problem where the engine is intact, but it's not producing force the way you expect it to, you can usually infer that there is something wrong with the signal being sent to the engine. There's something that could be preventing the engine from putting out as much force as it's capable of. And that analogy actually works pretty well with the human body. Now with the central nervous system, we're concerned with the brain and the spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system fatigue has to do with the nerves on the periphery, which actually connect to the muscles. So there's two ways that you can fatigue. One is by having peripheral fatigue, which really just means the muscles toast. This is what you're going to experience at the very end of an extremely hard workout. The idea of central fatigue is that there's a lack of drive. The brain and spinal cord actually can't send the signal needed to get the muscle to contract, even if the muscle is fully recovered and ready to go. Now, experimentally, the way that you find this out is you take a lifter and jam an electrode into their leg. And if their quadricep can still contract with that electrical signal, that means that they have central fatigue, that all you have to do is reintroduce an electrical signal and everything's fine. If the leg doesn't contract, that means that the muscles actually toast and it doesn't matter how much of a signal you send, you're not going to get anything out. As they say, you can't get blood out of a turnip. So this takes us to John Jakesh, whose best hits include this train wreck. Let's see what John has to say about CNS fatigue. What it takes to go to central nervous system fatigue and then how long it takes to recover from. So this is just uh, something I pulled out of the study. And you can see here's baseline. And this is after somebody exercises. You can see the excitability goes down. So baseline is like right where central nervous system fatigue is. So right after, so right right sort of after the exercise you get about a 10 minute window where you're not you're not able to really engage as much 20 minute window you're right back to baseline 30 minutes you can activate you know just as much uh above or at least you're above the baseline and then it shows an individual 
right about 48 hours later, there's another exercise session and they can engage to a much higher degree. So central nervous system fatigue is a thing, but it's not a thing that anybody really needs to worry about. So this represents a problem I have with the evidence-based side of things, because John, who's obviously very educated and obviously spends time in the gym, I mean, his arms are bigger than mine, he pours over the studies and comes to a conclusion that he seems very satisfied with. I find it very unsatisfactory because it doesn't have anything to do with how I have to concern myself with my training, my training decision. Anybody who lifts specifically for strength knows that there is no scenario where you lift very, very heavy on Monday and you come back 40, 50, 60 minutes later and are able to reproduce that effort. And what we're concerned about is how we reproduce efforts later in the week and even going into the following week. So the fact remains, we recognize that there is a phenomenon that exists when we are not as strong as we think we should be because all of our tissues are completely healed, all of our energy systems are completely restored, yet we fail to hit our numbers. See, John Jakesh is primarily worried about aesthetics. He doesn't have to worry about what his CNS is doing because it's not really relevant to his training. Power lifters, Olympic lifters, strength athletes do have to worry about it because that's going to determine how their next workout is going to go and how long it's going to take them to peak for their next meet. See, all of the training we do is primarily neurological. We're trying to increase our maximum ability to produce force, our max force production, and how quickly we do it, which is rate of force development. Those two things are extremely important. One is like a battering ram, which allows you to be very explosive, to jump high, to hit hard. The other one is kind of like the forklift ability. It's like a winch, like it allows you to generate a lot of force and recruit more and more and more motor units, even if it's very slow. You want both of those thoroughly developed and that's going to allow you to do the greatest number of things on the competitive field. But getting to that point where you can recruit a lot of motor units and do so very quickly, that requires you having all of your other structures adapt so that it is sustainable. Because if you don't, if you get that strength before you've earned it, that's when tendons can rip off the bone. That's when you can exhaust yourself potentially to the point of death. I mean, imagine if you're in the jungle and you're running from a leopard and imagine if you had the ability to run three times faster because you could just switch off the inhibition. Well, if you had that ability before, say your cardiovascular system was up to par, you would exhaust the muscles to the point where your heart would no longer be able to beat. Now, while the punchy quality and the grindy quality are both very important to being a well-rounded strength athlete, it is the grindy quality that is going to have the biggest stress on your CNS. And there's five big factors that allow you to look at a movement and kind of predict how taxing it's going to be. Number one is mechanical tension. Movements that feature more mechanical tension for longer are going to drain you more. So that's like a static lift, a squat, a bench, a deadlift versus something like a clean or a snatch. Cleans and snatches require a lot of aggression. They're very explosive, but they're very short, quick, and fleeting. Number two is going to be aggression. Movements that require a lot of effort, that require a huge surge of aggression to get the weight moving and to keep it moving are going to be a lot more draining than ones that don't. So an example is a deadlift starting from a dead stop requires a huge hit of aggression and a lot of effort to get it moving as opposed to something like a bench press, which typically is supported by the fact that it goes through an eccentric first. So aggression is required, but not nearly as much as something like a deadlift. Number three is load. Movements that allow you to handle a lot more load are going to be more taxing than movements that require you to stay lighter. Number four, range of motion. Movements that are taken for longer range of motion are going to be a lot more taxing than movements that are very short. So something like a partial, you might handle a lot of load, but if the movement is very, very short, it may not be as taxing as something that requires less load, but through a much longer range. So movements that have both high range of motion and high load, and there's a few of them, those are gonna be the most taxing. And then thing number five is the number of muscles that are used. If a movement involves a lot more muscles used all at the same time, that represents a much, much higher stress, and that's going to be harder to recover from. So if we use this list of factors that contribute to how taxing something is neurologically, and we try to predict which movements are going to be the most taxing, we can look at a squat, a bench, a deadlift, and we can come to some pretty predictable conclusion. A bench press uses quite a few muscles, goes through an okay range of motion, the load is high, but not quite as high as what you go through with the lower body. Uh, aggression is there, but again, it's not necessarily required as much as with a squat or a deadlift. 
and also mechanical tension is present the whole time. So going down the list with a bench press, there is consistent mechanical tension the entire time. Aggression has to be high, but not quite as much as with a squat or a deadlift. The load is high, but again, not quite as high as with lower body movement. The range of motion is pretty reduced compared to some other lifts, and the number of muscles is limited really to just the anterior muscles of your upper body. Compare that with something like a deadlift, and you have a ton of mechanical tension, a ton of aggression required to get the bar broken from a dead stop. You have a lot of potential load moved, for a very long range of motion and just about every muscle in your body is used. So when we look at it through that lens, it's really no coincidence that the deadlift takes so much longer to recover from than something like a deadlift. Even the squat, which checks a lot of the same boxes, isn't as taxing on the posterior chain because you get to stay more upright and it's a bit biomechanically friendlier, which is why there's going to be high frequency bench and squat programs but you're really not going to see high frequency deadlift programs. It's also the reason why when an athlete is tapering into a meet, their last heavy deadlift is going to be much further out than their last heavy bench press because it's going to take that much longer for the CNS to recover. Now, if we take this one step further and we look at movements that utilize fewer or smaller muscles, and if we look at the types of training that goes on in something like bodybuilding, you're gonna notice that that's where CNS fatigue really isn't an issue. If you add into the fact that bodybuilders really don't have to keep track of how strong they are on any given day, you can see how an aesthetically driven lifter's complaints of having CNS fatigue is kind of ridiculous. A bicep curl, for instance, or even if you look at isolation movements for the lower body, you're looking at few muscles used, you're looking at a pretty fixed limited range of motion, you're looking at the load being very small compared to compound movements, aggression doesn't quite have to be as high, especially for those longer sets, it's not one all out hit, you end up with kind of a jogging pace where you have to kind of sustain over a lot of reps. So in that lens, bodybuilding work isn't nearly as taxing, at least not from a neurological perspective. So we can look at other modes of training and get to the bottom of how they work around this in order to keep growth sustainable over time. If you look at Westside, it's very heavy on one rep maxes taken week in, week out, pretty much indefinitely with no deloads, no resets. So it's a question, how do these athletes sidestep CNS fatigue? Doesn't matter what your genetics are, it doesn't matter how much gear you're on. Eventually, if you are maxing out with the same lift week in, week out, you are going to backslide and you will very likely get some overuse issues as a result. Well, by switching out the movement, by utilizing bands, chains, specialty bars, changing grips, changing range of motion, you are creating small differences in how the body perceives these movements and you are taxing these structures in not quite the same way. That variety is a type of recovery, meaning if you switch the movement subtly week to week, your body is not going to be taxed exactly the same way. So those other structures that we're getting taxed, they get to recover in very subtle ways. And that allows you to keep building steam on these one rep maxes week in, week out. Now, obviously there's a trade-off. You have to be very good at selecting these movement variations, and it might not be appropriate for some lifters that will have a little bit of difficulty doing that. We can look at the Bulgarian system. Bulgarians max out all the time. Why were they able to get stronger if CNS fatigue is such a mother? Well, the fact is that these lifters were primarily using Olympic lifts and squatting. Olympic lifts are quick lifts. They're not under mechanical tension for very long. They go off like a gunshot. And squatting is very biomechanically friendly. You can sustain squatting with relative frequency because it is something we're designed to do. The fact of being upright means a very, very skilled squatter is not going to experience the same taxation on their upper back, their midsection, their posterior chain it basically gets turned into a standing leg press. So those two things made it very sustainable. Also, there was some citation that lifters that went through this type of training had substantial growth in their adrenal glands that allowed them to handle with this stress. So basically it was an adaptation of the CNS because all of the stress hormone that was elevated so often that would normally impede this type of function it created an adaptation that allowed them after so many years of grinding to actually get past what they called the dark times and have their body able to handle this amount of stress. Some programs do exist in that heavier strength specific range for much longer and expect lifters to handle that work for a longer duration of time. And those will accommodate by either changing the mode of training every block, again, creating that variety that allows a bit of recovery or by simply having a deload. This is exactly why we have deloads. Taking a week to drop the amount of work we're doing and the total amount of work 
is enough to allow just about any lifter to recover and come back the next week in fighting shape. And that's one of the reasons that I push bodybuilding training so hard is because it is a really productive way of decompressing from all of the really heavy sport specific work that we do. And it tends to serve a purpose. It tends to be very hard to mess up. And as long as you put your nose to the grindstone and you get better over time, you're going to see weaknesses round out. You're going to see your aesthetics change and you're going to see your base for strength potential widen out over time. So that's all I got for today, guys. Thanks so much for watching. Go ahead and leave your questions in the comments or better yet, take it to Patreon. That is where I upload my training weekly and that's where I answer all of your questions. I give form checks, I give life advice. Any question you got, go ahead and leave it there. That's the easiest way to get in contact with me. Thanks again. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.